This is one of the most contested bodies of water in the world. A third of all global maritime trade passes through this water, including more than half of China's exports. Vietnam's GDP is for 50% dependent on its marine activity, and the Philippines depends largely on its resources to supply its growing demand for energy. This is even before mentioning the strategic military importance, which got into high gear after the Second World War, and which continues to escalate today over the rising security concerns with the war in Ukraine. These economic, strategic, military, diplomatic and geopolitical reasons have led to each island in this sea to be claimed by at least two countries. This video is going to be a little bit longer than you might expect from this channel, but trust me, it will be worth it. I'll take you through the standoffs between the militaries of China and Vietnam, the artificial islands and the strategic provocations from the United States. This is the South China Sea Dispute with hindsight. Many building blocks of the South China Sea dispute resulted from the aftermath of World War II. In the 1930s, France administered several colonies in Southeast Asia, which were collectively known as French Indochina. But to their north, Japan was pursuing an expansionist policy, and they had already secured control over many cities on China's coast. In Manila Bay, the United States had several bases, and in Singapore, the British had firmly established themselves. The South China Sea suddenly became of urgent military importance because it was a buffer zone for each of these countries' military activities. The two largest archipelagos, the Spratly and the Paracel Islands, were claimed by France only a few years prior, but they were mostly uninhabited. To secure their claim, France sent three naval ships to the Spratlys and they placed their flag on the nine largest islands. The claim that France made was justified with historical records from Vietnam. These islands have appeared in maps and in texts since the mid 1600s. This map, for example, describes how Vietnamese fishermen had settlements on both archipelagos. France placed these islands for that reason under the jurisdiction of what is now Vietnam. But in May 1940, France was invaded by Germany and they were defeated just a few weeks later. Almost immediately thereafter, Japan invaded French Indochina and it took them only four days to secure all their territory. This coincided with Japan establishing a military presence on the Paracel and on the Spratly Islands. Two years later, in 1942, they controlled all the countries surrounding the South China Sea and they had built a major submarine base in the Spratly Islands. The Japanese surrendered in 1945 and the French retook control of their colonies. Taiwan immediately secured the submarine base in the Spratly Islands. This was in territory that France had formally annexed so they sent warships to patrol the archipelago. But they made no effort to evict the Taiwanese. This is something important that you need to understand about the dispute in those early years. These islands were very low on the list of priorities. They were disputed and there already existed conflicting claims. But each of these countries had more important conflicts that they were dealing with. Much of the importance that's now given to this history was not an urgent matter in those years. But after the Second World War came to an end, the claimants gradually made it a priority. China in 1947 published this now famous map. This map shows the South China Sea with 11 distinct dashes, from the Gulf of Tonkin, around the Paracel and the Spratly Islands, and narrowly even including Taiwan. This map showed all the land that the government of China at that time recognized as part of their sovereign territory. They later updated this map to have only nine dashes, omitting the two in the Gulf of Tonkin. And after 2013, they often included a small tenth dash, just off the coast of Taiwan. 
This map still serves as an important cornerstone of Chinese policy in the region. China justifies claiming all of these lands based on their historical records. It is well documented that Chinese fishermen were here before the arrival of European voyagers. They were from the island of Hainan and they lived a part of the year nomadically on these islands. The historical narratives of China and Vietnam are critiqued for many of the same reasons. The evidence isn't abundant and it's sometimes just coming from uncredible sources and many conclusions are based on implications. But besides that, there is very limited precedent for asserting legal claim solely on historical evidence without possessing undeniable proof of effective occupancy. The Japanese, however, undeniably controlled these islands during the Second World War. In the years that followed their defeat, the Allied powers in Japan negotiated terms of formally ending the state of war. And in 1951, they signed this treaty. Within it, Japan agreed to renounce all right, title and claim to the Spratly Islands and to the Paracel Islands. But this agreement does not state to which country the territory was ceded, nor did it define the exact borders. A few years later, an agreement was reached to dismantle the French colonial administration in Southeast Asia. This agreement was primarily aimed at the cessation of hostilities in Vietnam. This agreement led to the partition of French Indochina into three sovereign countries. But the agreement failed to mention the archipelagos in the South China Sea. The ambiguity in the peace treaty with Japan and the lack of clarity with the partition of French Indochina are amongst the building blocks of the dispute today. The archipelagos in the 1950s were already disputed, but they were low on the list of priorities for each of the claimants. And that's when a little twist of fate changed the dispute forever. The year is 1956. A group of Filipino fishermen was out on the water off the coast of Palawan when they were surprised by bad weather. It was a typhoon. They were forced to seek shelter and sailed into a remote area of the Spratlys. This event would change their lives. When the storm finally passed, they found themselves to be in a fisherman's dream. These islands, which were previously unknown to them, were the most productive fishing grounds that they had ever seen. They sailed around the islands for a couple of days, they fished and they explored, and they ultimately concluded that they were completely uninhabited. They returned home and spread excitement about their discovery. They returned a few weeks later with 40 other men to declare an independent nation. They called it the Free Territory of Freedom Land, with Flat Island as its capital city. And the mastermind behind this plan was Thomas Gloma. He called himself Admiral, and he dressed accordingly. He announced the formation of his country by sending a statement to newspapers, government entities and foreign embassies throughout the country. It was a short letter that informed the whole world that the islands are now claimed based on the rights of discovery. He wasn't aware at that time that the islands were already claimed decades earlier by a multitude of countries, but Kloma and his men actually lived here and they didn't encounter anyone else. Kloma wasn't an ordinary fisherman. He was the head of a nautical school. He was an explorer, a lawyer, and he had contacts high in the Philippine government. He later reaffirmed his claim by citing the San Francisco Agreement of 1951, where Japan renounced its claim to the Spratly Islands in order to lift the state of war. After this agreement, the islands weren't formally claimed by any other country and Thomas Coloma used this to support his claim. The response from the international community was very telling about the nature of the dispute in those early years. It was a good story, it received some media attention, and the countries with stakes in the region formally protested, and that was the extent of it. His country wasn't recognized by any other nation, but Kloma and his men lived there in relative peace for several decades. 
the late 1960s, the first oil was discovered in the Spratly Islands. Ferdinand Marcos became the president of the Philippines and he commissioned the exploration of the archipelago. Marcos ordered Tomas Cloma to be arrested and jailed on charges of impersonating a military officer. He was forced to declare that his country was now a principality and that the islands were now formally annexed. Cloma was forced to sell whatever rights he had to the Spratly Islands for exactly one peso. Two years later, the Philippines found their first major oil deposit, which would later supply 10% of the country's need for petroleum. These oil fields now comfortably fell within the new municipality of Calayaan, which loosely translates to freedom or liberty. On the other side of the South China Sea, the world was expecting a major political shift. Vietnam had been embattled in a war against the United States for almost 20 years. But two years prior, the Americans had decided to withdraw. The North Vietnamese were now rapidly marching towards a victory. China was also following these events and they feared how a North Vietnamese victory would affect their claim to the Paracel Islands. Both South Vietnam and China had several bases on the islands, which were manned by small garrisons of soldiers. One evening, a boat with six South Vietnamese officers and an American observer went on a routine inspection of the islands, and they discovered a Chinese vessel detaching troops on the island. This alarmed South Vietnam. They asked them to withdraw, which they didn't. After which South Vietnam responded by launching a military offensive against the Chinese occupied islands. The confrontation led to dozens of casualties on both sides. China, after this confrontation, took full control over the Paracel Islands. Meanwhile, in the Spratlys, the South Vietnamese still controlled a large number of islands. One night, a Philippine officer was celebrating his birthday and he invited all soldiers from the surrounding islands to come to his station for a big celebration. South Vietnam was an ally of the Philippines and was aware of these plans. And as a friendly gesture, they sent prostitutes to the party as a gift. And as the Filipinos were leaving their station to attend the party, the South Vietnamese waited from a distance. At midnight, they drove to the stations that were now unmanned and they replaced the Philippine flags with their own. The next day, the Filipinos returned and were baffled to find out that their friends had assumed control over their islands. They reported this back to Manila, but high officials there decided that it's better to ignore the event, to not compromise their alliance with South Vietnam. On the mainland, in the meantime, North Vietnam was closing in on Saigon, the capital of South Vietnam. And it seemed inevitable that they would soon deliver their final blow and two decades of war. As the North Vietnamese were preparing for a victory, they had concerns about how this would impact their influence in the Spratly Islands. In recent light to what happened in the Paracels, they feared that perhaps a defeat for South Vietnam could trigger an offensive on their positions in the Spratly Islands. As they were preparing for their offensive on Saigon, they were planning another offensive in the Spratly Islands. The North Vietnamese entered the archipelago disguised as fishing men. They laid low, took their positions, and tried to avoid attracting any unwanted attention. In the early morning of April 9, 1975, they launched their attacks. The entire offensive lasted 20 days, during which the North Vietnamese gradually took all South Vietnamese positions. The operation ended on April 29th, one day before Saigon fell and the Vietnam War came to an end. North and South Vietnam merged into the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and this was followed by an increased military presence of Vietnam in the Spratly Islands. Much of the archipelago was now effectively controlled by Vietnam. 
an ally of the Soviet Union, and to a lesser extent by the Philippines, which was an ally of the United States. The Philippines in 1976 struck oil again, this time near Reed Bank. Malaysia, a few years later, published a map claiming that these were their maritime borders. This included several of the Spratly Islands, which they now saw as part of their exclusive economic zone. And a few years later, Brunei made a similar claim. Their maritime borders, they argued, included at least one of the reefs of the Spratly Islands. They considered this to be part of their exclusive economic zone. In 1982, the United Nations, after nearly a decade of negotiations, reached a landmark agreement. This is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS for short. It was signed by dozens of nations, including China, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam, and it specifies the legal rights and restrictions for claiming maritime territories. This treaty defines on how to measure the breadth of the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, and the exclusive economic zone and the continental shelf. In a nutshell, it states that each country can extend its territory by 200 nautical miles, provided that it doesn't collide with another country's EEZ before that. Within this zone, the territory's owner has the exclusive right to exploit natural resources. But if a country's continental shelf exceeds the 200 nautical mile limit, a country can apply for an extended exclusive economic zone. Every country can make a submission of such a claim to the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf, CLCS, whose recommendations are final and binding. Even though China was a signatory of this treaty, it did not work in their favor in the South China Sea. They had claimed almost all these islands in the late 1940s with the now famous Nine Dash Line. Their claims were primarily based on historical evidence, but especially after signing this treaty in 1982, their legal claim to the islands was razor thin. Despite all of that, the region was more important to China than it has ever been before. To understand this, the period from the 1840s until the 1940s is referred to in China as the Century of Humiliation. It is widely taught in schools how China lost its influence in the world to the superior naval powers of Europe, especially during the Opium Wars. In this century, the Qing Dynasty lost its global superiority, they were forced to seize land, and their once great empire was in demise. The way that this is taught in schools in China is that this was due in a large part to the inferior state of their maritime security. This history is crucial to understanding China's stake in the South China Sea. In the mid-1980s, half of the world's super tankers passed through this region every year. This is three times greater than the Suez Canal and five times more than the Panama Canal. Controlling this region to China was a matter of protecting its military and economic interests. It was a vital part of protecting its maritime security and avoiding another century of humiliation. The Philippines in turn was massively profiting from the oil exploration in the region and Vietnam, with help from the Soviet Union, initiated exploration in three major oil fields. China intensified its military presence in the region in the 1980s. It started with an increased number of Chinese boats that were conducting patrols. Their presence was noticed by the Filipinos and the Vietnamese, but in the early 1980s, it did not yet escalate. In 1987, delegates from around the world came together in Paris for the 14th annual meeting of the IOC. They were discussing to set up a network of research stations in the world's oceans to monitor global sea level changes. China was asked to install five stations, of which one was in the Spratly Islands. The Chinese sent a boat with oceanographers to scout the perfect reef and they reported back with a plan to build it on Fiery Cross Reef. This reef was outside the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines and far enough from the islands that were inhabited by the Vietnamese. 
The oceanographers, however, were unaware of the territorial disputes. One morning, they were surprised to find out that on the neighboring island, the Vietnamese military was establishing a presence. The scientists reported this to their superiors, who told them to just continue their work. Without them being aware, the Chinese sent four Navy ships to keep an eye on the Vietnamese. They docked near the London reefs and Tittered Bank, where Taiwan also occupied a large island. The Chinese then reportedly started harassing the Vietnamese, and the standoff intensified. The next day, a Vietnamese boat arrived at Johnson's South Reef, carrying 100 soldiers and materials to construct a small station. The four Chinese boats followed them to the island. They were heavily armed. This was close to a Vietnamese settlement, which lay within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. The Vietnamese had planted a flag on the island the previous day. In an attempt to keep the Chinese from taking this, they took a small boat to the island. But the Chinese followed. As the Chinese soldiers entered the island, they opened fire on the Vietnamese. They simultaneously launched attacks on their boats, sinking two out of three. The other managed to run aground on Collins Reef to prevent being sunk. The Vietnamese formed a circle around their flag, but they were gunned down. 64 casualties were registered that day. China from that moment onwards assumed control over the island. They started building a bunker and in the years that followed, they occupied five other reefs and atolls in its vicinity. This firmly established the Chinese presence in the Spratly Islands. The 1990s were relatively stable. China controlled much of the Paracels and Vietnam controlled most of the Spreadleys, followed by the Philippines, China, Malaysia and Taiwan. There had been several diplomatic successes. China and Vietnam cooperated in a joint venture of the Spratly Islands. They allowed foreign companies to explore the region with Vietnam and China cooperating in offering them protection. In 1994, they all signed an updated version of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. This further solidified the legal framework to which they all agree. In 1995, they signed a code of conduct of the parties in the South China Sea, in which they agreed to notify each other of any military activity in the region. But with the turn of the millennium, the dispute got into high gear. The oil that the Philippines was extracting in this region now provided for one-fifth of the country's needs. The Philippines went through several energy crises in the early 2000s, underscoring the need to protect their assets in the South China Sea. Vietnam's GDP at this time was for 50% dependent on its marine activity. This was mostly from mining natural resources and to a lesser but still very significant extent, its fisheries. These industries employed millions of its people. The year 2011 was eventful. In February that year, three Philippine fishing vessels were fishing near Jackson Atoll when a Chinese warship approached them and told them that they had to leave. One of the ships had trouble removing its anchor, upon which the Chinese fired three shots. This happened within the exclusive economic zone of the Philippines. Only a few days later, near a major oil field that the Philippines controls, a Chinese vessel ordered a research ship from the Philippines to leave. It did, and in the days that followed, the Philippines kept a close eye on them, and they saw how the Chinese were laying buoys around the bank. This was an early sign of their intent to lay claim to this island. This to the Philippines was a direct violation of the code of conduct, in which they agreed that each party would refrain from inhabiting the then uninhabited islands. In March, 
China Mobile announced that they would include the entire South China Sea within their cell phone coverage. And in May, the Philippine president warned the Chinese defense minister of a potential arms race. Later that month in the Paracel Islands, a Vietnamese vessel was surveying the seabed for potential oil and gas exploration when they discovered that they were followed by Chinese boats. The Vietnamese were laying cables on the seabed and the Chinese followed and cut them. The Foreign Ministry of Vietnam accused China of deliberate sabotage, which was denied by their Chinese counterparts. This was only days before a major security conference in Singapore, which both countries were supposed to attend. The tensions were high. Only weeks later, China organized a massive military training in the South China Sea, complete with 14 warships, air support, and drills to protect and invade islands. This was interpreted by many media outlets as a message to Vietnam. But then Vietnam responded. An Indian company announced its cooperation with Vietnam to explore parts of the South China Sea. Shortly thereafter, in the Global Times, which is a mouthpiece for the Chinese Communist Party, an article was published with the title Don't Take a Peaceful Approach for Granted. It read, If these countries don't want to change their ways with China, they will need to prepare for the sound of cannons. We need to be ready for that, as it may be the only way for the disputes in the sea to be resolved. At the end of that year, Barack Obama was visiting Australia on what would become their most consequential visit of a US president in history. We welcome you here as you come, as an ally, a partner and a friend. So here's what this region must know. As we end today's wars, I have directed my national security team to make our presence and mission in the Asia Pacific a top priority. My guidance is clear. The United States is a Pacific power, and we are here to stay. The United States has clear stakes in the region. It too seeks to protect its influence over maritime traffic. This is in their economic and in their military interest, as their naval bases in the region rely on the supplies that are shipped for the South China Sea. They also want to have influence to ease tensions over the disputed islands. They stand to benefit from stability and peace. And lastly, the United States wants to limit China's growing sphere of influence in the region, which they might use against the interest of the United States. As we end today's wars... To Obama, the Pacific theater was a top priority. It's April 8, 2012. A surveillance plane from the Philippine Navy was flying its regular reconnaissance flights over its west coast. When they neared Scarborough Shoal, 250 kilometers off the coast of Manila, they spotted eight Chinese fishing vessels. They reported this to their superiors, who immediately sent a Navy ship to inspect the situation. The Philippine vessel remained at a distance and observed the fishermen for a few days. They then approached them to inspect their boats, and they found that they were illegally harvesting corals, clams, and live sharks. So they decided to arrest the fishermen, but then they were surprised by two boats that approached them. It was the Chinese Navy. This was a direct standoff between the Navy of the Philippines and China, which could have easily escalated into an armed confrontation. The Philippines, however, decided to retreat. From this moment onwards, the Chinese have occupied Scarborough Shoal. This confrontation led to a fierce diplomatic battle between the two countries, where both placed periodic bans on importing each other's goods, and it led to multiple protests in both countries. China started militarizing the Shoal, At that moment, in the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, a vote was held. And Xi Jinping was elected China's new president near unanimously. 
Under his leadership, China's position on the dispute would be drastically different. In 2014, a Chinese oil rig was moved to a position southwest of the Paracel Islands. This position is within what Vietnam considers to be its continental shelf. It bordered two hydrocarbon blocks that the Vietnamese were planning to explore in the near future. The oil rig was escorted by several Chinese Navy ships. This was a violation of their sovereignty. They sent 29 boats to try to disrupt the rig's placement and operations. This escalated into a conflict involving six Chinese warships, 40 Chinese Coast Guard vessels and dozens of smaller boats. With Vietnam deploying nearly 60 boats from the Coast Guard, surveillance and fisheries. There were several direct assaults and one Vietnamese boat was sunk. But moreover, it led to massive anti-Chinese protests in Vietnam. Thousands of Chinese evacuated as the protests gradually turned into riots. The Chinese Navy, in the meantime, sent one of their prime assets to the Spratly Islands. This is a 127 meter long dredger, the largest of its type in Asia. And since the beginning of 2013, it was deployed in the Spratly Islands. It started its work near Quarteron Reef, where it stayed for a couple of months before it moved to the south of Union Reefs. A few months later, it moved to the north, then to Fiery Cross Reef, and ultimately to the Gavin Reefs. This was the largest of a fleet of dredgers that the Chinese used for a near-secret operation. The presence of China in the Spratly Islands had thus far been limited to a few sparsely distributed stations. Like this one here in Fiery Cross Reef. This is a satellite image from 2007. And this was in 2015. This is what the dredgers were up to. The island was completely reformed. Fiery Cross Reef in 2020 was fully operational. This hangar can accommodate four combat airplanes. These domes are radar and weather stations, and these are manned observation towers. There's a 3,000 meter concrete runway with more hangars on the other side that can accommodate an additional 20 airplanes. And this is the smallest of China's three big artificial islands. This is Subi Reef. The picture is taken in 2012, and in the next years, the Chinese dredgers were working with unprecedented efficiency. In 2020, it became the largest of their artificial islands. This here is a mobile crane, which is used to transfer cargo between the ships and the dock. Here, there's a lighthouse and a defense facility. These are multi-story concrete buildings, presumably for offices and housing. Here, there's an underground storage facility, most likely for fuel, water and food. The runway is also 3,000 meters long. It has hangars on both sides. On the other side of the island, there are underground tunnels for ammunition and other military equipment. It is speculated that these buildings here have retractable roofs, which can be used for their mobile missile launchers. This island is of particular concern to the Philippines, who have a station on the nearby Titu Island, and they are heavily outarmed by the Chinese. The last of the three large artificial islands is on Mischief Reef. This is an image from 2015. Five years later, it looked like this. They had reclaimed almost twice as much land here than they did on Fiery Cross Reef. The base is equipped with four defense facilities, five hangars and state-of-the-art communication towers. These three artificial islands, together with the smaller but yet significant construction on the others, make up what Western media call the Great Wall of Sand. But China states that its intent is to provide shelter, to aid in navigation and to provide assistance to ships that are passing through the region. 
When Xi Jinping was visiting Washington in September 2015, he publicly stated that China is not militarizing the artificial islands. It's May 2015. The United States was flying a spy plane over the artificial islands. On board were journalists from CNN. The conflict between the US and China now escalating. China's foreign ministry has lodged a formal complaint with Washington in response to the mission, which was met with eight ominous warnings like this one. Oh, this is the Chinese Navy. This is the Chinese Navy. Please go away quickly. The Chinese Navy urged them repeatedly to leave. Um, I saw a study recently of all the times in history when a rising power, in this case China, comes up against a status quo power, in this case the United States. 70% of the times in history, the result has been war. That's how important this is. And you think war is a real risk? Yes. Yes, you do. absolutely. War between the United States and China? Yes. A former CIA deputy director commented shortly thereafter that the risk of war with China was very real. Shortly thereafter, a U.S. warship was in operation in the South China Sea. This was the first of a series of freedom of navigation operations. The ship navigated to Subi Reef, where the Chinese had their largest military base. And it entered the 12 nautical mile border of the Chinese military. China considers this to be part of their sovereign territory. And for the U.S. Navy to enter these waters, it would have needed to ask permission. With this act, the United States made clear that it doesn't acknowledge Chinese sovereignty over the islands. The US Secretary of Defense later said that the ship entered the 12 nautical mile limit of five maritime features. These features are claimed by China, Taiwan, Vietnam and the Philippines. And he clarified that no claimants were notified, which is in accordance with international law. He reaffirms that the United States does not take a position on which nation has sovereignty in the Spratly Islands. This was consistent with the stance of the United States over the past few years. They do not formally take a side, but they aim to protect their national interests. The South China Sea dispute was a lightning rod for the relationship between China and the United States. China's foreign ministry showing off this piece of aggression by Vietnamese ships, ramming some of its vessels. The dispute is now being played out on a local level through these kind of interactions. The Chinese captain is turning towards them and they brace for impact. The Coast Guard from one country rams the ship from another. These are terrifying encounters with real danger to life and property. The United States operate in the South China Sea on a daily basis, and this leads to frequent standoffs with China, who interprets their presence as a provocation. In 2020, ExxonMobil started drilling the Blue Will gas field in cooperation with Vietnam. The exploration of this field had long been postponed, but is expected to be worth about $20 billion. And this could supply 10% of Vietnam's surging demand for electricity. With the scarcity of natural resources, the increasing value of global trade and the weakening global security, the importance of the South China Sea is now more important and tenser than at any other point in history. I made a whole lot of other videos about the region. Continue watching by clicking one of these two videos next.